Jesus with his new belly, and he's the bright and the morning star. And Jesus with his new belly, and he's the bright and the morning star. Amen. Amen.
as an individual in order that we may uh, be pleasing to you and be a blessing to those around about us. Amen. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to be more concerned about those on the outside. Help us to be instrumental in helping someone else to understand your will and way. Yes. We pray for our communities and our neighborhoods. We just pray that you bless uh, each neighborhood and just help us to have uh, safe communities. And we just pray uh, you, that you will uh, things, cause the things that are contrary to your will and way to be eradicated. And we pray that you would help us to be good examples in our communities, our neighborhoods, help us to always be the very best that we can be, whether we're, uh, regardless of where we are, help us to be uh, examples for our children in the church, and help the parents in the church to uh, do all that they can do to instill in their children the things that you will have us all know and do. Yeah. And we just pray that you will be with us as we go through worship service today. Pray that all the things to say and do here this morning be pleasing and acceptable before you. Pray that you will bless uh, those who are away, Sister Norwood in particular. Yes, we pray that you will allow her to have a safe return and right. others who are not aware of this time, but we know that she knows who they are. Yes, we just pray that all will be well with us all throughout this day. And we just pray that you will be with us all the days of our lives. Forgive us of our sins and when life here should be no more, we pray that a home in heaven will await us. Amen. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
of some type, or you could be six feet deep right now. Amen. But God allowed you to see another day, gave you a vocal course, and the ability to give him the thanks and praise he so rightly deserves. Amen. So as your brother in Christ, your servant, your minister here, I commend you for making the sacrifices you have to be in the house of Almighty God today. Amen. Of course, we thank you also if you're visiting with us, we want you to continue to visit with us. That is, we want you to continue to know that you are welcome here and that we want you to continue to worship and fellowship with us at all times. Anytime you see those doors open, you can come on and walk on in and we'll greet you with a smile and friendliness and say, keep on coming back because you're certainly welcome here. All right, what we're going to do then today is go to Romans chapter 8, verse 33 and verse number 34. We've got quite a bit of ground to cover. So I don't want to delay any of those uh, uh, thoughts from God to lay on our hearts here today. So Romans chapter 8, verse 33, and verse number 34. Brother Perry talked about how it's such a big script I gave him, font, so they can read it. But I need it just as much as he does. And so I'm glad to have a big, big Bible in front of me as far as electronic version that I can look at and read from at the same time. But as always, we need to pray my wife in as she's already going to worship service out in Atlanta, but is on her way here to spend some time with us in the house of God as well. Amen. Romans 8, verse 33 and 34. Let me read it out of the King James Version just to get us started. When you have somebody say amen. amen. All right. Now the writer is talking to Christians. So he's talking directly to the church then and to the church today. Look what it says. Now it says, who shall lay anything? To the charge of God's elect, it is God that justifieth. Verse 34 is the key scripture that I want you to put under your belt as we go through the message today. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Really pay attention to that last part. Who also maketh intercession for us. So again, that's the reading of Romans chapter 8, verse 33 and 34 out of the King James Version. Just want to 
Intrigue your mind and build your spiritual character by three words. Worship God only. Amen. Worship God only. You're going to find out what that means as we go through uh, the message this morning. Now, one thing I have to put out on the table and be unashamedly telling you this. That is that we've had an abomination in the world for over 1,500 years. What I'm talking about is Catholicism. And what the remnants of Catholicism are actually in practically every church that exists in the United States, in much parts of Europe and Latin America. And of course, they've had a bad influence on the minds of others because they, made, they have a man-made church. Y'all scared of this, but that's all right. I'm going to call Amen. it what it is. Man-made leadership. A man-made doctrine Amen. that can't save nobody. Amen, Amen y'all. Amen. And so we're going to talk about some of the highlights of that beast, that Roman Catholicism that has uh, plagued the world for a long time. Amen. You may be saying, well, I'm not Catholic. That's just going to apply to me. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I work with a lot of folk that say they ain't Catholic. But say something bad about the Pope. Ooh, you going to hell. <laughs> they ain't even Catholic. In other words, that's why it has so much bad influence on the world that we're so ingrained in our culture that parts of us are Catholic that shouldn't be Catholic Amen. to begin with. But let me get back up here for a minute. You're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. Believe me. It's not about hatred or doubt in anybody, but the truth must reign whether it ticks people off or not. Amen. The truth must go out there even if it makes enemies. In the process. Oh, how many of y'all politicians are you Christians instead? I hope we're Christians. We leave politics aside. You see, look what I'm talking about here this morning. I believe that when it comes to the topic of worshiping God only, we should start with the common practices of what they do call praying to the saints, which is done in error today. Let me tell you something I read off the Our Catholics Prayer website. Now, obviously then, don't quote me as saying this is the truth. What I'm showing you is, is what error that they generate, and we're going to refute that. We're going to show the error in this statement. So on this, I quote, here's what they wrote. Some people ask, why say prayers to saints? Should all our prayers be to God? Praying to the saints is praying to God in a fundamental way. We're praying to those who can ask God to help us in our various needs according with his will. Now, how many of y'all know that Satan will call God's name and lie on him in the process? Amen. That's just what happened in that quote that I just read for, uh, unto you. Let's talk about this for a moment. Now, they believe that dead men can approach the throne of God for you and win God's favor for you. Now let me tell you something right now before we get too deep into it. There's nothing a dead man can do for you. Amen. Did you have to understand something? When somebody dies, they don't have access to the throne of God. Amen. And I'm going to show you that from a biblical standpoint. So a lot of this is just common sense, right? But I can also show you this from a biblical perspective. But the problem is with the world is that the world don't know God's word. And when you don't know God's word, anything can be pulled in front of you or pulled on you. If you don't have anything out there to say, show you that you know you're lying. And you need to quit telling that lie the side of your mouth. Amen. But if you don't know the word of God, you can't do that, right? And you become gullible, and then you become a, a, a sheep that's out to the star. That is, you'll fall to the wolves in sheep's clothing. That claimed it from God, but nobody sent them but Satan. Amen, y'all. It didn't come from God. It came from Satan. Because my Bible still says in John chapter 8, verse number 44, that Satan is a murderer and he's a liar. Amen. And that those that follow him are his children. Amen. And so if they're going to lie on God, that means God didn't send them. Amen? Amen. And I'm going to show you right now that God didn't send a Catholic church. He didn't send a priest. And he showed it send a pope. Amen, y'all. Truth is the truth here. Amen. So let's biblically examine their doctrine in which they talk about their saints can actually help us in this message 
But first, let me talk about three key things that they talk about here. Now, they got hundreds of them, I'm sure, but let me talk about a couple of them now. Now, obviously then, when you have false doctrine, you're going to have a degree of truth. What I mean by that, they're going to call a lie out, but they're going to associate it to somebody's name that's actually in the Bible. Right? For instance, one of the key saints that they have is Joseph. Now, we know that Joseph truly existed. In the New Testament, he was the adoptive father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But there's nothing in the Bible that tells us we can pray to Joseph for anything. Amen. But see, for in their doctrine, they say that if you need a job, go and pray to Joseph. That's supposed to be Joseph's specialty. Let me tell you this right now. If you're praying to Joseph, you're going to still be in the unemployment line. <laughs> because there's nothing that Joseph Amen. can do for you. Amen. Amen. Truth is the truth. One of the other key saints that they talk about is St. Gerard now. Now, he's not in the Bible nowhere. Amen, y'all. But what's supposed to happen with that? If you're a person that struggles with fertility, that you're trying to get pregnant, supposedly, you're supposed to be able to call on St. Gerard, and he's supposed to be able to go to God, then the next thing you expect it in nine months. Let me tell you something else. If you pray to him, ain't nothing going to happen. Amen. Because he don't have no power over the fertility of a woman. Amen, y'all. I'm just telling y'all the truth. They have another one that they call St. Peregrine, if I got it correctly in the pronunciation. Now, his specialty is supposed to be cancer. In other words, if you have cancer, he's supposed to be able to put that in remission for you. Well, my friend, if you don't know any better by now, that is just yielding to cancer. Because he does not have any control over that type of healing in your life. So Amen. praying to Joseph, although he was a good man, praying to Gerard, praying to Paragon, uh, and all the other so-called Catholic saints is in vain because they have no power to intercede for anybody on earth here today. Amen. Also, there's a process that they talk about that they call canonization. Y'all familiar with that? In other words, if a man lived holy enough and in many times had enough miracles associated with him, they would officially recognize him as a Catholic saint. In other words, he's supposed to have some type of buddy-buddy relationship with God. He's supposed to be better and of more, more in integrity in him and holiness than the general population. And so obviously then, here's what it says about canonization I also got from uh, the Our Catholic Prayers website. Here's what they talk about with their so-called saints. They say, and I quote, they became canonized, that is to say officially recognized as Catholic saints after their deaths. This was usually done after a lengthy review of both the holiness of their lives and miracles associated with them. Did you catch any red flags? Oh. Right there. Oh. Yeah, all of it, actually. <laughs> It is the truth. You see, number one, what do they say? That the church, the Catholic church, reviews their lives. Now, my first challenge on that process is, who told you you can do that? Amen. My second challenge is, is, are you holy enough to do it yourself? Are you able to walk on water? Are you able to raise the dead? Are you able to just go to a dead girl, J. Iris' daughter, and say, a, man, a damsel rise, and she just get up? Well, you know what? That means you have no power to judge nobody's life. Amen. And what is your standard of holiness? How holy do you have to be? Become a Catholic saint. Amen, y'all. You know? What type of miracle did they have to do in order for you, the Pope, and the cardinals, and the bishops, to say, hey, here's somebody. We're going to add to our list of saints that people can pray to. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. I don't think you see where I'm going with this here yet. Because obviously then, if you don't know this by now, no man has the biblical authority to judge the holiness of another man. Amen. Huh? Amen. That is the domain of Jesus 
in Jesus only. Oh, amen, somebody. If you don't know this by now, let me show you directly from the scripture who has the power to uh, judge the holiness of anybody. If you do, look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1. Out of the New King James Version, it's going to identify who is the judge of all mankind. It's no bishop, it's no cardinal, it's certainly not no pope. Amen, somebody. Amen. Because 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 1, out of the New King James Version says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will what? Judge the living and the dead, and whose? His appearing and his what? His kingdom. So who is our subject? Jesus Christ. And God says, what he going to do? He will what? Judge the living and the dead and what? His appearing and his what? His kingdom, which is not the Catholic Church. Amen, Amen. Amen somebody. Amen. I've never seen Jesus talk about, well, I'm the head of the Catholic Church. He didn't say anything like that. When you look at Matthew chapter 16, verse number 16, he said, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church. And so if it has a name Catholic, it don't have the name Jesus on it. If it don't have Jesus on it, it means he, he's not in it. And if it don't have Jesus' name on it, it don't fit Ephesians 5.23. Well, the Bible says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Man. And so if it does not bear his marksmanship on it, doesn't bear his name on it, in other words, it ain't his church. Man. Amen, somebody. Man. It's Man. not his kingdom, and that means it can't save nobody. True is the truth. So obviously, then, if anybody, just like these Catholic councils are doing and have been doing for centuries, are going to judge the holiness of anybody, they have usurped authority. They have taken authority that didn't belong to them in the first place. Amen, Amen. somebody. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I refuse to follow a thief and I refuse to follow a murderer. You can if you want to. But I ain't doing it. You're going to do that on your own. Amen, somebody. Amen. And I hope you understand where we're coming from from the scriptures here today. Also, let me show you another thing. Common sense wise, why this canonization is something that came from the devil. Why you can't pray to the saints, all that kind of stuff. Number one, we've established that Jesus is the judge, right? And so nobody has the authority to do that in the first place. But also, let me show you something else why it doesn't make sense. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 1 to verse number 3, where it violates the concept of what the Bible is talking about. Now, if you don't know this by now, long story short, I'm going to show you directly from the scriptures that everybody in this room is already a saint. We don't have to wait till we die Amen. to become saints. The moment you take on Jesus in the water and grave of baptism, your name has already been changed from sinner to saint. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. You have already gone from, Christ, uh, from a sinner to Christian. You have already gone from sinner to child of God. And you don't need nobody to vote on whether you are a saint or not. Oh, amen. Come on now, somebody. Because the Bible tells me in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 on down the chapter, that those that were baptized were added to the church. That means they were already saints. They were already sanctified. They were already forgiven. And they were already on their way to heaven if they stayed faithful amen. unto death. We don't need no... I don't, I, don't, I don't see that in Acts chapter 2, do you? Do you see anybody in Acts chapter number 2 after they got out of the water that the apostles and everybody else said, let's sit back and now let's vote to see whether they're Christian? Huh? It's not in the text, is it? The Bible says immediately after they were baptized were what? Added to the church. Amen. And so they were already what? Saints the moment they got out of the watery grave of baptism. Amen. Huh? So how can any crook and no liar no murderers tell me whether I'm going to heaven? Man. Oh, amen. Y'all scared of this kind of stuff. I fear no man. Amen, somebody. Oh, I got some Matthew 10, verse 28, Christian in here where God said, don't fear man, but fear him that can kill body and soul in hell. We fear God. Amen. Ain't nobody else. But let me show you this. Class of chapter 1, verse 1 to verse number 3. Now, let's see what the church was called, the members of the church was called while they were still living. Didn't nobody have to die to become a saint? Amen, somebody. Look at who's, who's writing. Paul is writing to the church of Christ that was located in Colossae at the time. And so this is the head of the letter. In other words, basically it's like writing a letter here today. 
you have what? A from and you have a what? To. Okay. So Paul is going to be the from and what? He's going to be writing what? To the church of Christ or those living members at that time. So Colossians 1, verse 1 to 3, it says the following, not a new King James Version. Here's the what? From Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and what? His other author with him was what? And Timothy, our brother. Now, who is he writing to? Who? Let me hear that one more time. Who are you writing to? The saints. The saints. They were already what? Saints. And they were what? Living at the time. Amen, somebody. So who is he writing to? Let's look at it. Verse 2, it says, to the what? Saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are where? In Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God who? Our Father and the what? Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, amen, somebody. If you're a faithful child of God, somebody say, well, you're a saint, you better say amen. Amen, because you are a saint in God's book. So Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, that means already Christians, right, who are in Colossae, that's where they worship, grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So as you can see, Paul was writing to the church of Christ located at Colossae. And can I use a, a, a common sense idea on you right now? Paul had to be writing to people living because uh, dead people can't read. Amen. 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 So obviously then, he is writing to somebody that can read it and hear it, right? That's still alive on this earth. And what do you call them? Saints and what? Faithful brethren in Christ. Christ, who are in what? Colossae. So again, so he was writing to living Christians, and he called these living Christians what? Saints and faithful brethren in Christ. So the next logical question then, really, at this point, if you're a Bible believer, we can just shut this down right now and say period. Because the Bible has spoken, right? Right. But let me deal with something else that they do, and we're almost done. The next logical question becomes, well, what about Mary? See, one of the Catholic teachings that's out there is that Mary had to also be God. Oh, y'all know that, don't you? That's one of the teachings, that Mary was divine just like anybody else. And so now that's one of the reasons why they pray to Mary. Now, let's deal with that for a minute. The Bible tells us when the angels approached her, they said she was highly favored as a woman and not as God. Man. She was not divine. I'm not knocking her by any form of fashion. She was a, a, a highly favored woman in the Bible, but God never elevated her to the status of divinity. He never put her as God on the same level as himself. Oh, amen, y'all. And so when you look at anybody from a spiritual standpoint, with the exception of the church that's alive today, nobody has access to God except for those mentioned also as God. Let me show you this for a minute before I lose you here today. So in other words, for Mary to have interceded in heaven for anybody, she must also be deity. She must be on the same level as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It said, even simply, she must also be God in order to speak to the Father in heaven as an intercessor for us. Well, this can't be true. Because look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to verse number 20. We can show that Mary is not God just from this scripture alone. Look what Jesus says. Now, this is the resurrected Lord of heaven and in earth. This is the one that died for us. And look what he said. He said, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying what? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Let's go to verse 19. This is the one I want you to really capitalize on. When you see the truth here, you're going to see Satan is a liar when he calls Mary a God. Look what he says in verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, let's go back there for a minute. Verse number 19, I think you're going to miss something in here if I don't point it out to you here today. 
Notice, in the name of means by the authority of. Because if you're divine, you have the authority to say, this one qualifies to be baptized. Baptism means that you're admitting them into the church, the same group of people. And what that verse is saying is that all that is divinity agrees after you teach them and they believe and are baptized. The Father says, baptize them. The Son says, who is Jesus, baptize them. The Holy Ghost says, who is also God, Acts chapter 5, verse 3, verse number 4, he says what? Baptize them. Because why? Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are God, and they can what? Authorize whether or not somebody should be saved. Now, what don't you see in here? If Mary was a God, it would have to read the, as follows. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost and of Mary. Amen. But you don't see that, that last part I said in there, do you? You don't see and of Mary because Mary has no authority to save anybody. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. Otherwise, she'd be on the same note as what? Son, Father, and Holy Ghost. So this shows you Mary is not divine. As many people believe, and as such, she has no power to intercede with God for us. In other words, she can't get a prayer through for us. She was a great person, but she was not divine and cannot help us now. So who does the Bible say are those that can intercede? In other words, can get into the Father's ear for us. First, number one, you ought to know one is Jesus, don't you? Amen, hey, man, somebody. Didn't we just read something about that a minute ago? You look at Romans chapter 8, verse number 33 and, uh, 33 and 34. Let me actually go forward on that one. And look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22 and verse number 23 to verse number 25. So that again, that's Hebrews 7, verse 22 to verse number 25. This, which is written, tells us who can really intercede for us. You see, the Bible says, now we're talking about Jesus. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a what? Better... Testament, verse 23 says, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. That's saying Jesus is our final high priest. Verse 24 says, but this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to do what? Oh, do you see the word there? He is our go-between between between us and God, the Father. Amen, somebody. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lived to do what? To make intercession for them. So we got an intercessor in Jesus Christ. So we don't need Joseph. We don't need Gerard. We don't need Peregrine. And we don't need Mary either when it comes to intercession. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 26. There's another intercessor in our lives that actually communicates to the Father for us. Look what it says in verse number 26. Likewise, the Spirit, we know that's the Holy Spirit, right? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now that's black and white, don't you? The Bible says, but the Spirit of what? Itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. There's one other group of people that can make intercessions for us. Paul exposed that to us in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse number 1 to verse number 3. And this is remember the, 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 the context of what we're talking about. God is instructing Timothy the local preacher of what to tell the congregation to do. So this is instructions for the local congregation to intercede for our sins. All right? Now look what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1 through number 3. It says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers. What's that next word, y'all? Oh, you see how the word of God harmonizes? All you got to do is study it, right? I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving the thanks be what? Made for all men. So what's he telling? He's saying the church pray for 
these things. He says, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in what? All godliness and honesty. The final verse says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So you see the three intercessions that can be made, right? One is what? Jesus, first and foremost, right? Because we wouldn't be able to communicate with the Father, period, if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus. Making a way for us to have a relationship with the Father. He also sent the Holy Spirit to help us, right? Who also brings our thoughts and even the things that we can't even talk about. That he knows we need better than we know for ourselves. He brings them what? To the Father for us. And then you have the church itself living for it. Amen, y'all. Living folk on earth in which what? We're supposed to go to God on behalf of each other. Amen. We're the other intercessors. But you don't see any dead man in there, do you? No. Amen, amen. So what does that do? That puts down canonization, right? That puts down praying to the saints, doesn't it? It puts down Catholic Church doctrine when you pick up the Bible. Amen. And know the truth. Boy, amen. Am I talking to anybody? Amen. Here today. So obviously there, there's no dead men or women mentioned who can get a prayer through to God for us. So this means that Mary, all the so-called canonized Catholic saints, and even our ancestors, cannot get a prayer through to God if they did. Oh, why did I bring up the last one? Because most people in here are of African stock. Man. And we brought some stuff from Africa. That should have been left Man. in West Africa. Because we'll say in a minute, now this came from Africa. Y'all don't know this now because we've been doing it for 300 years. It just became a part of our black culture that you'll understand. Man. We'll say in a funeral in a minute, I know mama putting in a good word. <laughs> oh, come on now. <laughs> Daddy up there talking to God for us. <laughs> it don't work. Like that. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. We talk about the Bible only identifies three intercessors. Y'all remember what it was? Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and us. Amen. That's it. So don't come tell no lies outside of your mouth. Now, you can lie even if you ain't thinking about it, right? <laughs> There's some things that you got to take out of your culture and throw it away. This is stuff we did long before we got on the boats to America. Amen, y'all. Because we worship ancestors. And so we brought that over here and started just calling the mom and daddy. Oh, amen, y'all. Marching around heaven, getting a good word in for us. No, guys. That's not biblical. God tells us to pray on our own, doesn't he? And then the Holy Spirit carries that to the Father for us. Oh, amen, somebody. Did you see it in the scriptures? That's the only way you're going to get a prayer to God. Amen now. So stop praying to the dead. The dead cannot help us. Besides, who you pray to is who you worship. Prayer is to be addressed to God and God only. So if you are praying to anyone outside of God, then you are worshiping that person. And that is sinful. Remember, prayer is an act of worship. So in conclusion, Keep it simple. Pray to the Father only. Jesus taught us this in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 9. Look what he says. When he, who we to address our prayers to. He tells us this. He said, blessed, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the, king, uh, the children of God. Actually, what I want is this. He said, after this matter, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, what? Hallowed be thy name. Who did he tell you to pray to? He didn't say pray to Mary, did he? He didn't say pray to a Catholic saint, did he? He didn't even say, Mama, Daddy, help me. Huh? What did he say? Our Father who art in heaven, what? Hallowed be your name. Your name is holy. And I'm not going to adulterate your name by calling somebody else's name. Oh, amen, somebody. That's true. That's the truth. Now, you're kicking him off the throne when you put somebody else up there and say, hey, put in a good word for me. Instead, you can't do that. You see, folks, you cannot get a better intercessor in heaven than Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We don't need help from anybody else. Oh, amen, somebody. 
So hopefully you can process this and understand and take it in your own practices when it comes to practicing your faith and your prayers and being able to share this with somebody else. If you didn't get it all, I'll gladly give you my notes. You can take it home with you. Amen, y'all. So you can present it to somebody else. But most of all, don't you dare get caught up in this mess. Amen, y'all. Because the devil know how to make a whole lot of evil look holy. Amen. Amen. You'll make it sound good. But at the end, it's poison unto your soul. Think about how many souls he done damned over 1,500 or so years. He's caused a lot of people to miss God and miss him completely. Huh? Over things that sound good, but were lies upon lies upon lies. Amen, somebody. Amen. The truth is the truth. But if you're a child of God and you walk disorderly, you know you still serve a God of grace and mercy. You know he has written Acts 8, verse 22 and 1 John 1, 7 and verse number 10. What you must do if you have backslidden, if you have walked far away from God through a lack of faith or a lack of obedience, you can turn that around right now. You can restore your relationship to him. You can be forgiven again and back on your way to heaven if you repent. And if you will confess to God that you have messed up and ask him forgive you, he's going to do that right now. We know that repentance just means to change your path. That is to change your mind and leave whatever the sinful act was alone and start living right again. It's a recommitment to the Christian life. If you're not a child of God, you've got to make that initial commitment in order to be saved. God tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, the first thing you got to do to be saved, he says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It may not be apparent in the part of the plan of salvation, but I can tell you why. Because in John 3, verse number 16, the Bible talks about who Jesus is. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have church what? Everlasting life. In other words, you're not going to make it to heaven if you don't believe that Jesus literally is the Son of God. He's that same Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts that suffered on that cruel cross of Calvary, died there. But on the third day, he rose from the grave and ascended after 40-something days on, uh, on the earth into heaven where he is now seated at the right hand of God, crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. You'll see that in Acts chapter number 2. And of course, you also saw in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and verse number 2, that Jesus is the judge of all mankind. So obviously then, you need him to make heaven your home. You need him before you die here on earth. Because you have to understand that this uh, decision to be a Christian must be done before you die. If you notice, everything we talked about today... The dead don't have no power to change things. Huh? Right. And so their eternal fate is sealed after they die. Now, one thing I have to ask you, even doctors die today. Huh? Doctors are always predicted, well, you got six months to live. And some people live 50 years later. If they were so smart, why do they still die? Huh? I don't care how many PhDs they have, how much continued education they have. The Bible tells us that it's appointed once for man to die. Then the judgment for everybody out there. But one thing the Bible don't tell us is when you're going to die. You don't know that. That's something God has kept under wraps in heaven. Only he knows that. So please do not say in your own heart, well, I got tomorrow. I have next week. I want to finish some things off. I got to go to the bar a little bit longer. That's what they're talking about. I'm just telling you what it is, right? Yeah. You may not have to not let alone tomorrow. Amen. 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 To get it right in God. So hopefully you understand what Jesus did for you. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 and Romans 6 verse 23 talks about the dire situation that every man is in, including myself before Christ was in my life. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But what Jesus did was magnificent. It was amazing and something that you can take advantage of. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. He's talking about hell, actually. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. 
You see, when Jesus died, that paid the price of our sins. If you believe and obey our Lord and Savior, Amen. Jesus Christ. If you believe, I can meet you right now. But there's more you have to do. You cannot stop at believing. You see, you can believe all you want from a common sense standpoint. You can believe you're a college graduate, but if you don't go to class, you're not going to get your degree. Amen, somebody. Amen. The truth is the truth. Amen. You can believe that I'm going to be a well-cut bodybuilder, but if you don't pick up a weight, you're going to be 30 pounds overweight. Amen. <laughs> in other words, you've got to do the work in order to get the reward. That's what Jesus talks about, the things that we have to do, not just believe. He tells us in Matthew 7, verse 21 to verse number 23, what he's going to do with believers that don't obey. He tells us, not everybody that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. A lot of people are believers in that passage of scripture, but he's going to say to them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Why? Because they would not obey the word of God. So if you believe, that's good. That's two parts of the plan of salvation. But there's more that you have to do. Jesus also tells us in Luke 13, verse 3, in verse number 5, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. In other words, this is the very moment that you say in your mind, I'm no longer to live as a sinner. I'm going to live as a saint. In other words, Jesus now is truly my Lord. I'm going to live according to what he wants me to do, which is called righteousness, and leave a sinful lifestyle alone. You must come to that conclusion before God will save you from your sins. So you must repent. The fourth step in God's plan of salvation is that you must, with your mouth, confess Jesus as the Son of God. What I like about this commandment is that God gave us the commandment and the example at the same time. He tells us in Romans 10, verse 9 and verse number 10, that with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And he gave us a man, an Ethiopian eunuch, in Acts chapter 8, verse 37, that was taught these exact things. And before he was baptized, that means admitted unto the church, admitted unto the saved, he made this confession in Acts chapter 8, verse 37. He said, I believe. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And just like that Ethiopian eunuch, just like the Apostle Paul, just like anybody that's ever saved, documented in the Bible, you must pass through the watery grave of baptism. And most people ask, well, why? Because God said so. Jesus said in Mark 16, verse number 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. That should stop it right there. But what are the benefits of baptism? Acts chapter 22 verse 16 tells us, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. In other words, that's when God cleanses you. That's when he forgives and forgets any and all things you have ever done in your life. That's when your new beginning begins. When you go down in that watery grave of baptism. So we see that it's the moment of forgiveness for you, and we see that it's the moment that you're saved, and it's also the moment that you're added to the church. You have to understand something. When you're a Christian, the Bible says you're in Christ. The Bible says you're a child of God, and it calls you a Christian. And we can establish when that happens also through baptism, because Galatians 3, verse number 27 tells us that those that have been baptized have been what? Baptized into Christ. That's when you're truly a part of the family of God. Then after that moment, you come out of that water, that, that, that pool right behind me. Get out of it just like that, that Ethiopian unit that got out of that, that watery grave of baptism rejoicing. Because obviously then your conscience is clear. That means there's nothing that God is going to hold against you at the judgment day. And that you are a part of the family of God. You can call God your father in truth at that very moment. And, of course, we know that after we become a Christian, Revelation 2, verse number 10 has to always stay in front of our eyes, 24 hours, 7 days a week, where Jesus said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. In other words, you have to finish what you started. In other words, you can't just believe now and quit believing, and you can't just, just repent now that is live the Christian life and stop living it. 
Faithful means that you continue to believe and obey until the end of your life, and heaven's going to be your home. Are you ready to make that commitment today? Well, this is your opportunity right now. All we're going to do is sing a song of invitation. That's to give you some time to come out of your seat. Come down that aisle. Give me your hand. Guard your heart. All I'm going to do is ask you that simple confession that every Christian preacher is supposed to ask you. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you confirm your faith just like an Ethiopian eunuch did, we'll go down in the water behind us right together. Then you'll arise a new creation where all your sins will be washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. You don't know if tomorrow is coming for you. You don't know if tonight is coming for you. You don't know if 10 minutes is promised to you, which it isn't from now. So take care of this thing right now instead of taking a gamble with your spiritual life. I'm just telling you the truth. If you walk out of here, you're playing Russian roulette with your soul. And why do that? Tonight might be the bullet in the chamber. Amen, y'all. And that could be the end of you. And heaven won't be your home. Won't you come as together we stand and sing the Lord's invitation? Won't you come on down and out? Give your confession, be baptized, and let's do this for the Lord.